Chapter 5 Mr. Jan When the school day finished, Paul and I hid behind some bushes and watched the school gate. We saw many classes go home, and some teachers, but we didn't see Mr. John. The minutes passed. Maybe he went home by car, I said. At that moment, through the bushes, we saw a man with black hair and very high cheekbones walk past. It's him, I whispered. Wait. He mustn't suspect that we are following him, Paul said. We waited two minutes. Okay. We can go, I said. We followed him at a distance, and finally we saw him go into a house. It was a pretty, pink, two-story building. There was a lawn in front of it and a big tree on the side. We crept up to the window and carefully looked inside. Mr. John put his briefcase down and opened the refrigerator. He took out another bottle of that horrible green liquid and put it on the table. Then he went upstairs. Now what can we do? Paul whispered. No problem. I can climb the tree, I said. Are you sure? Of course. Don't forget, I play volleyball. Be careful. I went to the tree. It wasn't very high, and it was easy to climb. From my position, I could see his room. Mr. S. John was there. What's happening? whispered Paul. He's sitting in front of a mirror, I said softly. His hands are on his head. Oh, no. What? What? asked Paul. The teacher was totally bald, and his head was covered with disgusting brown warts. I felt sick. Suddenly, I noticed my reflection in Mr. Stone's mirror, and Mr. Jan noticed it too. He brusquely turned around and stared at me. I was paralyzed with fear. My mouth fell open. I was expecting the worst. Instead, Mr. Jan didn't look angry. He actually seemed very sad. He opened the window. You students think I'm weird. Come inside. I want to tell you something. Mr. John, I'm terribly sorry. I started to say. I was extremely embarrassed. Don't worry. Since you're here, please come in. I climbed down the tree. Paul was very nervous. Come on, Seema. Let's go away before it's too late. No, Paul. I'm going in. But... I went towards Mr. John's front door, so Paul followed. The teacher opened the door and made us sit down in his living room. Do you want something to drink? He asked. No, nothing. Thank you, I answered. What are those warts on your head? Asked Paul, ignoring the look I gave him. These warts are the results of a throat tumor. You see, I started smoking as a teenager, and I continued until the tumor. Chemotherapy made me lose all of my hair, and I developed these warts. You've probably noticed my voice. Unfortunately, the tumor destroyed my vocal cords. So now I speak with a voice implant. The tumor has caused very serious changes in my life. I started to suffer from depression, and I still see a psychiatrist. I also moved, hoping to start a better life in a new environment. In fact, I'm from Wisconsin. You see, I'm not married, and the illness has made me very lonely. People don't like illnesses. They stay away from sick people. Sick people bother them. Mr. John, we really feel terrible about our behavior. I said. Yes, we really apologize. We hope you can forgive us, 
added Paul. Don't worry. In a sense, I'm glad this happened. I haven't talked like this to anyone for a long time. You see, I want to be friends with my students. That's why I asked your class so many questions. But it's very hard for me to smile or be cheerful. Try to understand if I'm strict or unpleasant. I smiled at Mr. John. I was very moved. We understand, I said softly. May I ask you a question, said Paul. Paul, I exclaimed. It's okay. Ask me anything you want, answered Mr. Stone. What's that stuff you eat at lunch? Oh, did that scare you? The green liquid and the black pills are part of my treatment. They include protein and other nutritional substances. And why, excuse my curiosity, were your eyes amber-colored yesterday? Well, I tried some colored contact lenses. I wanted to do something different. I thought that a new look could make me feel better, but it didn't work. Mr. Jan, I began. I saw you at the park this morning. Gee, I probably appeared very strange to you with all those movements, he said. My doctor suggested early morning exercise in fresh, clean air. You really have watched me these last few days, I must say. Paul and I looked at each other. We felt rude and very silly. We were ashamed for being so inconsiderate. Well, Mr. Jan, we don't know how to thank you for your hospitality and kindness, I said. We really don't deserve it. Our behavior. That's enough. That's enough. Don't worry. Thank you for your company. I'll see you tomorrow at school. And remember, if you ever want to come and visit me, you're always welcome. Thank you very much. We'll come again, said Paul. Paul and I left Mr. Jan's house and walked home. Well, I think we've learned a lesson, Paul said. We must remember that many people in this world are suffering. Many people have problems. And if they act in strange ways, there are reasons. There isn't an alien behind every bush. There's a person, just like you and me. And maybe this person needs friendship and a helping hand. I looked at Paul with affection and admiration. His words expressed my own thoughts perfectly. We had let our imagination and superficiality dominate us. This made us forget human feelings and problems. I thought about Mr. Hans and his artificial arm. Even in that case, I had overreacted with my ridiculous suspicions. Hey, Paul, I said. I want to celebrate. This adventure is over. I feel relieved. Let's go to the rainbow and buy an ice cream. Okay, Sima, good idea. Let's call Sona, too, I added, thinking it was the moment to inform her about everything. Sure, we stopped at Sona's house and invited her. We sat down at the rainbow and ordered three sundaes. Sona! We have news about Mr. Jan, I said. Yes, although it's a very long story, Paul added. We told her everything. The news on the comet and the intergalactic meetings. 
Our class must be much nicer to him, she said. But this comet, maybe aliens will come to Earth? Sona, please, I don't even want to hear the word alien, I exclaimed. Let's keep our eyes open for people in need, not for aliens, Paul added. Okay, okay, sorry, said Sona. From the window of the ice cream parlor, I noticed that it was already dark. I looked at the time. My watch wasn't on my wrist. Oh, no. My watch, I exclaimed. Then I remembered. I left it in the gym. I took it off at recess to play volleyball. I must go and get it. But Seema, I'm sure that the janitor will find it and put it in a safe place, said Paul. I don't trust him. That watch is so important to me. It was a gift from my grandfather. He's dead now, and it's the only thing I have of him. I must go to school immediately. But the school's closed now, Sona commented. No, not today. Mrs. Ching is at school all evening, because she's preparing some math tests. I know, because I heard her talking to Miss Smith. Okay. Well, I'll see you tomorrow then. I have to go home and start my homework, Paul said. Me too, Sona added. We left the rainbow, and I went towards Jefferson High. The back door was open. I went in. Our gym is on the ground floor, but I didn't go there directly. Something stopped me. I felt a strange sensation. I didn't know what it was. Something wanted me to climb the stairs and go up to the classrooms. I felt afraid. The school was dark and silent. I shivered. Where am I going? Why am I climbing these stairs? I thought. My heart beat faster and faster. Something terrible was at the top of the stairs. I sensed it. But what? I desperately wanted to run away and return home, but I couldn't. The mysterious force inside me made me go on. On the third floor, I heard a noise. Someone was moaning. As I passed by the janitor's closet, the sound became louder. Someone needed help. I opened the closet. It was Mrs. Ching. The old teacher was on a chair with her hands and feet tied. She was gagged and her eyes were open in terror. Mrs. Ching, I whispered. I took the cloth from her mouth. Help, she said. Someone is doing something wrong, and he or she is here now. The person is in disguise. Okay, Mrs. Ching, stay here. Whoever it is mustn't suspect anything. I put the cloth back in the teacher's mouth and left the closet. I looked around the second floor. I was terrified. Everything was silent. The long, dark hall was very frightening. Then I noticed something. A light was on in the computer room. I crept to the door. Someone inside was working on a computer. I could hear fingers clicking on the keys. Slowly, very slowly, I opened the door. Just a crack. It was Mr. Hans. He was typing a kind of code on the screen. Was it a password? Then he took a small plastic object from his pocket. It looked like a key. He inserted it in the diskette slot. The screen blacked out. 
it flickered. Then something appeared. It was the face of an alien. The alien had a green head and big red eyes. It didn't have hair, and it didn't have a nose. Its mouth and ears were very small. Then Mr. Hans put his hands on his head. He was pulling at his hair. It started to come apart. He was taking off his hair and his face. A green, bald head surfaced. I realized that he was identical to the alien on the screen. He put his face on the computer table. Then the false Mr. Hans started talking. Clyreg calls base. Clyreg here. Clyreg calls base. L tank Pilex. Clyreg. How is your mission proceeding? said the alien on the screen with a mechanical voice. For now, everything is okay. But I'm already tired of this mask. And I hate speaking this barbarian language. English is not a barbarian language, I thought angrily. I'm sorry, but your voice implant must stay inside you until the mission has finished. Then we can remove it. Tell me, does anyone suspect you? said the alien. No, I don't think so. I had a small problem with an old math teacher, but I was in disguise and I tied her up in a closet. So, everything's fine. Ha ha ha. You're wrong. I'm here now, I thought. I hope you're right. Our mission can't fail. The spaceship must come this Friday. We'll land in the old abandoned airfield. We'll wait for you there. By 9.30 p.m., you must be ready. You must have the two students to take to Mitrax. We can't be late. When the comet leaves the Virgo constellation, we won't be able to travel anymore. The intergalactic doors close on Friday at midnight, said the alien on the screen. I know, I know. Don't worry. I must still choose the two students but I think I know who I want. How will you capture the students? You can't touch them because you're electric. Aha! Uh -huh. So, the story of his prosthesis was a big, fat lie, I thought. On Friday evening, there is a family teacher's meeting. During the meeting, I'll leave the other teachers. While the parents are listening to the teachers, I'll ask the students to come with me. I'll invent an excuse. Then I'll take them to the science lab, and I'll spray them with my hypnotizing spray. Once they're hypnotized, they'll do everything I say. They won't be able to think or rebel. We'll go out of the building by the fire escape exit, and walk to the airfield, said Mr. Hans Dutch Clireg. I'm sure he wants me, I said to myself. Be at the airfield by 9.30 p.m. Then, Clireg, good luck. All tank Pillix, all tank Pillix. Gortz, said Mr. Hans Clireg to the alien on the screen. Then he took the key out, and the computer screen returned to normal. I silently closed the door and quickly went back to Mrs. Ching. I can't tell you anything. It's for your own safety. Just act normally, and no one will hurt you, I said. Who? Mrs. Ching started to ask, but I escaped down the stairs and ran out of the building. 
I stopped running when I was far from the school. My watch was still in the gym, but at that point, I didn't care. I had a lot of difficulty sleeping that night. I decided to tell Paul and Dana, but no one else, no one would believe me.